the, the first question uh, that's been put is the importance of balance. Uh, and whether we have here at 1641 depositions, as a point was made, I think, by Jane at the very beginning, uh, that we have very much a one-sided source here that gives uh, of the Protestant experience uh, uh, during the uh, 1641 rebellion uh, and the importance of uh, looking at both sides uh, in trying to come up with a more balanced picture, and in particular with the engaging with uh, literary sources and what they can tell us uh, of the, if you like, the, the native uh, reaction and experience during this time. So, Jane, I don't know if you just want to make a a comment on that uh, in particular. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I would also add the archaeological evidence. Uh, David Edwards edited a superb book on atrocity in early modern Ireland and drew attention to archaeological evidence from Carrick Mines that uh, clearly demonstrated the havoc that Sir Charles, Sir Charles Coote wrought against the Catholic population of Carrick Mines. And you see corpses who have been attacked, obviously from behind in defensive uh, positions. But thank you for that. OK, and just with regards, I mean, John, just uh, the, the second question there was regards the tolerance uh, shown by uh, Cromwell in general, a point you were making in your own talk, uh, but obviously uh, in particular at Clonmel, uh, where I think the point was made that he was deceived, which I think, well, maybe that is questionable, but uh, perhaps just might, might comment uh, specifically on the experience of Clonmel. I think that it's on there, John, already, so. Yeah, I think that is important, that, that, that he gave me his word in good faith when he found out that things weren't as he thought. I think the... the, the um, uh, the other thing is that the commander at Conmel was later at, um, at Limerick, and that in fact that there's a, the, the, there was an attempt by Ireton to hang him, um, and um, his own officers overruled him, and the officers who served with Cromwell refused to let him be hanged. So there is already, I think, that is some of the evidence that there is a different kind of standard being applied by the one than the other. Mm. Okay, so there's a couple of hands up there. So Jeff with the back of the beard and then over there. Thank you. That's you. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. As far as I can see, anyway, I need your glasses going. Okay. I'd just like to thank all the people for this fascinating uh, presentation. And my question is about the linguistic uh, quality of the deposition. So I'm not sure is it appropriate for the yeah. next project, really. Um, the first speaker mentioned there were 8,000 uh, witnesses, many of whom couldn't write themselves. And there's a much lower number of commissioners who took their, their evidence. I'm wondering, has it been or is it planned to be to compare <coughs> the, the nature and the quality of the language used by people who gave evidence to the same commissioners, perhaps using the software that's currently being used you know, in, um, in the cases of uh, people who claim that the guards or the police have fabricated their statements, to see if there's the same types of sentences being used by the commissioners in evidence from a wide range of people. Okay, uh, I just uh, to repeat the question there. I mean, it's sense to do with the linguistic, uh, the nature of the linguistic evidence uh, and what we can learn from that. And in particular, can we begin to see, uh, if you like, patterns of language being used, given that there were such a small number of commissioners who were taking the statements compared to a large number of people who'd uh, given given. Exactly. And what I do is actually just hand over, because uh, Barbara Fennell from the University of Aberdeen is actually the person who is leading uh, that particular part of uh, the 1641 Depositions Project, if you like, very much from the linguistic side. So, Barbara, do you want to... Uh Thank you. Um, yeah, that's a pretty, pretty sophisticated question, actually. <laughs> there is no doubt, and, and actually it leads to my question to Ben, so that, that was perfect. Um, <laughs> um, there is no doubt that this is all mediated testimony. And it's, there's also no doubt that it's mediated in different ways by different commissions. There's also no doubt that as the, as the depositions move on in time, certain types of testimony becomes kind of ritualized and we, we have issues there. Um, so, uh, the, um, but there are myriad other complications. We, although we can identify commissioners, we can't identify the clerks. Um, and so we are facing huge problems, but we are indeed looking at exactly this issue of what is real, uh, Nick, Nikki McLeod, who I think, oh, she's up there. Um, Nikki's uh, about to um, uh, work on a paper on the role of direct versus indirect speech, direct witness testimony versus indirect, and there's a huge amount of extra work to do there. But that allows me to just say to Ben, well, actually, can, can, can you just comment on that, and then you can ask questions. Yeah, sure. <coughs> 
First of all, there has been a lot of work done um, in England on, on depositions in you know, much less dramatic circumstances than this. We, we can draw on the relationship between deponents and those who are taking down their words. Uh, the only thing I'd say is you may have noticed on the examples we put up, particularly one of the ones that Jane put up, that there is a very extensive um, changes made. And you can see quite obviously at some times the opponents are not happy with what's been written down and are getting it corrected. I think there is, there is a one, I mean it's not the only thing that's going on, but at one level that's going on, there is this very, very strong desire to record for, you know, what happened, I mean, to, for the truth telling. Um, and he, not as we say, truth as remembered, truth as a storm, not truth as it happened. But that, the, the, the extent to which those writing down the depositions are finding themselves having to change. And it, I, the, certainly in the, a lot of the early ones, it seems to me the changes are clearly ones which the transcribers are being required to make by the deponents, not the other way around. Okay, um, so there was a couple of other questions, but Barbara, just given there was a, a linked question, perhaps you just want to quickly ask that one and then maybe to go with the other just, people just behind you. Just to bring Ryan in, uh, 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 sorry. Ben. 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 With English, and we have enough difficulty um, working on, you know, sort of variable peoples giving variable evidence. But at least the people who are writing down the depositions are literate. Don't you have a problem that your sources are often, um, well, they're mediated by people from different language groups, and also they're in areas which have oral tradition rather than literate tradition at the time. So just say again, just the issue there of uh, different sources where they're mediated by people coming uh, with uh, different languages uh, and they're in areas where there's very strong oral tradition, so that, uh, how that impacts on the nature of the evidence that we're looking at. So Ben. Actually in Southeast Asia in the early modern world, literacy was increasing along with the building of kingdoms and standardization of culture and uniform rule. Uh, and so there are surprising numbers of written sources which survive. But also there are reports from a particular ethnic group about what another ethnic group did, which is you know, indirect and often hearsay. Uh, and I think particularly in the case of Southeast Asia, you need to corroborate and triangulate the sources. That's very important. But I, 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 particularly in the Buddhist countries, uh, all Cambodian boys spent some time in a monastery learning to read and write in Khmer, often in Pali as well. So they would be able to write uh, in, in the... Sources can be so that sources. You, there are sources. In the case of Cambodia, because of the destruction from so many outside invasions, the court was constantly moving and being destroyed and archives were lost. But in the case of Burma, Thailand, Vietnam, Java, there are extensive records. Uh, in the modern period, it gets much more uh, possible to access large um, uh, amounts of material. Uh, the UN sponsored tribunal in Cambodia has just found guilty of murder and crimes against humanity. The commandant of the prison uh, during the Khmer Rouge period uh, in which about 16,000 people were tortured and killed and about 4,000 of their confessions survive in various drafts. Uh, it, it's not analogous to the depositions of 1641, but it's a similar size archive uh, in which, with much more determined uh, supervision, these prisoners were tortured to write various drafts of their confessions, told to say that they were agents of the CIA, the KGB, and the Vietnamese all together, uh, and to you know, come up with these terrible al false allegations against themselves. Uh, but there is a lot of real ma material in there which has been written down by literate people, often just of peasant background, but they knew how to read and write and the, uh, those uh, tortured people left a lot of information. Okay, Catherine, you've been waiting patiently there. Uh, yeah. Hello, um, my name is Catherine Morris. I think it's extraordinary to see um, both of these kind of, uh, well, Project 1641, but also to hear this contemporary uh, narrative as well coming out of Ben's work. Um, ben, I just wondered, um, I mean, obviously an incredible part of the 1641 deposition project is the digitization, is all of these other kind of um, aspects of new technology bringing into a historical record. Um, and I wonder, um, in your own contemporary work, how, how, how is that influencing how you're thinking about 
you know, archive, outreach, uh, digitization of, uh, of, of the material that, that you have? So there's the question of the digitization of the material and that it's, it's an ongoing digitization across the humanities, how that's affecting uh, the work you're doing, Ben, in your archives, etc. at the moment. Uh, in the Cambodian case, what we did was microfilm the confessions and all other Khmer Rouge documents we could find, including the entire archive of the security police of the Pol Pot regime. But I, I must say I'm very impressed by what the 1641 project has achieved, the massive transcription project alone is something that uh, is much more difficult to match with Khmer handwriting. Uh, but uh, I, I admire what you've, what you've done. Uh, Willie, <coughs> just up there. Yeah. Well, first of all, I just congratulate that it's pretty obvious to be a magnificent achievement within three years of this rich material, because it's, it is clearly, ethnographically speaking, one of the richest. Because we've, we're hearing people speak who, who usually are not given a voice exactly. because yes. of the ground. However, it, of course, and uh, Jane pointed out that there are problems of balance, but leaving that aside, there's also real problems of how we represent now the names of the groups even mm -hmm. involved. There, there's a real issue with how we do that, and the, the, it's very good to see that you're going to develop this comparative over four periods. Because I'm struck by the fact that we haven't located, at least the discussion up to now, in a, in a colonial context. Mm -hmm. and, uh, not just European, but extra-European. And one of the comparisons that has struck me as important was Ben's reference last year at the International Conference <coughs> to Genocide by the Oppressed is the similarities with what happened with Indian uprisings in Peruvia, in Peru and up in Bolivia, etc., a little bit later in Latin America. The similarities between the reaction to Spanish imperialism and what happened in Ireland. And I was going to ask Ben, uh, would he give a view on what relevance the comparisons are to these kind of colonial contexts in Latin America, which you may be familiar with? Just a question on the, the, the relevance of the colonial context and the need to look at this in the colonial context and in particular regards to, to uh, Southern America. I think, uh, Willie, was that the question? Yeah. I, I think that, I'm, I might be wrong about this, but I think that there was a good deal of discussion in, in, in England and in Ireland even during the Spanish colonial conquests and the wars of the conquistadors in Mexico and Peru. Those uh, atrocities, uh, in the case of Mexico, I would say genocide, uh, were fairly well known in Britain. And uh, there, was, there were um, accounts published, uh, I think in, even in English, uh, but certainly in, in translated from, from the Spanish. But, uh, and I think uh, Las Casas' critique yeah. was well known. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there was a sense in some uh, circles that it was perhaps justifiable to give the Catholics back a measure of what they had dealt out. I, I don't know whether that's uh, a reasonable reading of the evidence or not, but I think there is, a, if you like, a, a sort of an international history of atrocity, uh, of examples serving as uh, sometimes models, sometimes counterexamples. And it so much depends on how individual people and perpetrators caught up in these events, <coughs> decided what they were going to do about it. That's why I think it's important to find, uh, and there are plenty of them to be found, the dissidents who refuse to go along with what their uh, cultural or political <coughs> or religious uh, confreres were doing. Okay, probably time just for two more questions. We're just unfortunately running out of time, guys. We're saying, Alan, you've been waiting there. Sorry, you want to, yeah. My question is addressed to, um, to Jane and to John. Um, as you're probably aware, together with John Horne in the Department of History, I published a book on the German atrocities, 1914, atrocities committed on Belgian and French civilians. And, um, and one of the things we tried to do was, of course, to take evidence from both sides. So it was a transnational, transcultural project. And uh, I think your project is absolutely stunning, and I'm so impressed by it, by the completion of this project. But to write the history of the atrocities of 1641, 
um, one would have to look at the evidence of perpetrators, and I'm wondering what the nature of the evidence of the perpetrators might be, if, it's access if it is uh, accessible, and um, if so, how it could be used. Uh, just to do with the, the question of the evidence uh, of the perpetrators and how it might be accessible and how it might be used, so don't John or Jane or both if you want to. Well, clearly, it's, it, there's an asymmetry. I mean, there's, there, is, there is a significant amount of Irish literature later on, a kind of memorialisation in poetry and so on from the 1650s. Um, there, is, there, there, are, there are depositions which do reflect on, um, on Protestants killing, uh, killing Catholics I mean, within it. So you, what you can begin, and what you can certainly see is how some particular um, acts of atrocity are themselves said to be responses to something which we don't have accounts of, but which, as except in so far as it, they're reported as being the occasion of this particular one. So the sources are are, are deeply asymmetrical. Mm -hmm. But of course, where the of course, like any kind of uh, conversion into uh, into part or uh, into a, an Irish poetry tradition, which itself is going to be informed by by a whole history or a sense of how this fits into its own history and is stylized to fit into that history. But of course that's what historians do, they interrogate these things, they look at ways of, of interrogating these sources to see what is recoverable. But in the end, um, in the end that you're never going to get as far with that source as you can with this particular one. What you can look at obviously is the way in which the perception of what happened itself shapes the history. And that's what I was trying to just begin to talk about today <coughs> because, because so many things happened subsequently as a result of how this material was understood at the time and how that was productive of particular kinds of response. Uh, Alan, can I just say, John at the conference last year yeah, spoke good. about your incredibly rich material that you had to work on and, and that you've got both sets of depositions. That must be almost unique. That's just extraordinary. And the work that you and, and John have done there really, I think, is, is exemplary. Only, you know, we look at on with envy, only if we had that level of documentation for both sides. Okay, sorry, yeah, just very quickly over there, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Now, I've got uh, a question for Professor uh, Marlon Dolmeyer. Um, Professor Marlon, you've talked about the difference between eyewitness um, testimony and uh, hearsay testimony. But then, just how difficult is it to actually distinguish between those two? And, and are there not a hell of a lot of problems? And is it not? I take it it's not very much... Well, my, my, I mean, this... Uh, I'll just repeat that for a thing, just to say that uh, the, the distinction between uh, uh, witness, eyewitness testimony and hearsay and the difficulty in distinguishing between the two. So, sorry, John. Um, I, I think this uh, becomes more blurred with time, but, of course, it's important for those who are taking down the, the testimony because they are conscious of the difference in English law. And so it's the use of verbs like I saw, I heard, these words are very, very frequently added to make it clear that for future use, because any blurring of that would make the deposition very difficult to use in, for some of its possible purposes. Now, I'm not suggesting that they are able, as people are passionately pouring out, and they're going uh, these things to keep them hermetically sealed off. You can see, I think, at times that some of the commissioners are saying to people, now let's be systematic, let's hear first about all the goods that were destroyed and taken, then what did you actually see, then what, did you, what else can you tell me? And you can see that pattern as being the fundamental pattern. Mm -hmm. But as people start telling their stories, of course, they, they, they do say, and what's more, those same people killed so and so and so they, they, do, they do bleed together. But there does appear, in my view, particularly in the early on, to be a really clear attempt to impose that structure on the deposition so that they could, so what could be used from what could not be used directly. I mean, the great merit of here, apart from people being allowed to testify uh, about everything they knew, the other thing, of course, is that if you do hear, if you do allow the hearsay, that might allow the commissioners to go in search of evidence of these alleged events. So the fact that you know there was an alleged event in another place means that you might then be able to go and interrogate people from that area or tie it all together. So I think that I think there is a, a real consciousness of the need to keep these separate. But in the kind of turmoil of people wanting to tell talk of their trauma, it's, it, it's never going to be as clean as I think as I think the commissioners are trying to make it. 
Okay, sorry, there's one last question up there. I've been waiting a while there. Thank you. Just yet, yeah, yourself? Yeah. Uh, just um, on the depositions, on the financial losses which the people, uh, uh, you know, went through, uh, what would be modern thinking from the insurance industry? <laughs> <laughs> this is just on the financial now. It's nothing to do with mortars or, or killing. But um, <coughs> were, were people overemphasized by 30%, 40%? Yeah. Or was there any means of double-checking for commissioners at the time that the claims of loss of property Okay. Okay. So the question is basically just you know if you like how realistic or legitimate were the claims that were put in in the depositions for uh, losses of property, etc., and whether any effort has been made to to ascertain you know to this particular point. I'm not quite sure with regards to modern insurance companies, but anyway, uh, whether Jane, you want to uh, take that point up there. Great question. Thank you very much for that. Uh, obviously, you've got to take uh, every deposition and do your best to corroborate it. But I just want to, and I'll come back to that in a minute, I just want to make a very general point. These are sworn legal testimonies. This is the 17th century. People take God very, very seriously. And I think when they are actually swearing on oath, that means something <coughs> to those people. Um, well, it means a lot, so hugely important uh, uh, to them because that's part of the air that they breathe. Um, I also think that you need to think about the context in which they're deposing. Um, it could well have been in a crowded room. These groups of refugees would have going would be going to Dublin, and it could well be that your neighbour is, you know, a couple uh, of people behind you in the queue, and he or she would say, "Well, do you know what X?" So they only had 10 cows, they didn't have 20. And, and so there's this self-regulation uh, going on. Uh, just the third point, where we have been able to corroborate this material, we've got something called the books, the statute staple books, which are basically the 17th century equivalent of a, a credit network. The closest thing the 17th century has to credit cards. It's, it's, it's very hard to, uh, 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 it, it, you, you borrow money on bond and, and the bond is secured by land. Lots of these staples or bonds are mentioned in the depositions and we've been able to cross check. And so Trish Stapleton, who's here somewhere, did a wonderful thesis on Dublin merchants and she systematically went along trying to cross check these and there is evidence that they were telling uh, the truth and where we can corroborate it uh, it pe appears to be actually remarkably accurate so I think it's very unfair to impose on 17th century people uh, uh, the habits if you wish of the 21st century. <laughs> Okay, on that particular note, and I apologise, I know there's a number of people who had questions, but we had uh, strict instructions to be done by quarter past five, and it's just gone 5.15, so we'll have to finish up. Uh, so before we do that, can I just uh, very quickly uh, just say that two things. First of all, the exhibition itself is now uh, on in the library, and everybody who came today, you all received uh, a, a free uh, ticket to go to that. So please do, guys, go and see this exhibition. It's absolutely wonderful. Uh, it's well worth going to visit and to see some of the actual depositions there themselves, and various other artefacts that Trinity College has in its most wonderful collection. The second point is to get onto the website because uh, really for us uh, it's getting this material out and used and accessible to people uh, and also to get the feedback from people as well. So we're really anxious to hear back from as many of you as possible uh, on your experiences of the website and of the material itself uh, and how you find it. So it is now uh, since Wednesday sort of uh, uh, openly, it's on open access on the Trinity website 1641. Uh, .tcd.ie so please get on and start using this material uh, and I would just finish by saying that you know, what we've seen today is that yes this is the end of one stage of the project but really we're just beginning now to exploit this material and the uh, possibilities are just really endless here and already people have sort of touched on one or two things that have particularly interest me in terms of work that I would be interested in getting involved in here as well and we're really hoping that this as I say is something that will just continue to grow and grow and having made this uh, as I say widely uh, accessible now that we'll see the fruits of this research over the coming years. So I'd like to thank you all very much for coming along uh, this afternoon uh, to take part in this symposium uh, and uh, provost and colleagues and friends uh, it's been great to see everybody here uh, and to take part in this particular event but before we leave I'd just like you to show your uh, appreciation to our three speakers this afternoon Jane, John and Jane.